what I'd like to start with, I know some of you have seen it, but um, idea of how banks make money. What is it they're doing? And I think it's really important if we can get a handle on how interest rates work, why they're there. Because I think a lot of times we take it for granted as to, to what's going on. And the easiest way to show this is by back up in time a little bit. So I'd like to go back to the 80s. Um, any of you remember that time? Remember what interest rates were like at the bank? We saw some pretty high rates on CDs, 9%. I mean, they bumped up a little bit. We even saw some 10, 11, 12s, but they kind of hung in the 9% range. And in fact, that is where universal life came from because the banks could not compete or the insurance companies could not compete with the banks. And in order to try to solve that, they started tying life insurance policies rather than them being from the insurance company. They started tying them to an outside asset. And the result was, in reality, it pushed a lot of the risk from the insurance company onto the insured. So it was a problem. But what we saw was, again, CD rates at 9%. And what people don't do, typically, when they look at rates, is talk about actual dollars. And that's what's really critical. So if we talk about $100, let's say Kim deposits $100 in the bank. And if the bank is paying 9%, how much is the bank going to have to pay Kim to rent her money for a year? Nine dollars, exactly. So for every hundred dollars Kim has in the bank, they're going to have to rent it for nine dollars. Now, what if I need a hundred dollars and I come to the bank? First thing is, are they going to loan me their money or are they going to loan me Kim's money? Kim's money, right? They're just going to sublet her money to me. And in those days, there was about a six percent spread. So. The banks were charging 15% on car loans, consumer debt, those kind of things. And if you look at it, 9 to 15, the bank's making 6%, right? Well, how much am I going to have to pay the bank back to rent my $100, which is actually Kim's money, for a year based on a 15% rate? $15, right? Okay. If I can... If I'm in the hardware business and I can buy hammers for $9 and turn around and sell them for $15, per year that's a 66.67% gross profit, not 6%. Okay, there's no difference in what the bank's doing and what any retail business does. They're just marking up money, right? So when we look at this, most people look at 9 to 15, and they call that 6%, when in reality it's 66.67. This really isn't very widely known. Um, in fact, I would say most bank presidents don't know that. Um, why doesn't the bank loan me their money? Why did they let loan me Kim's money? You might know. Always. Right. Right. But even locally, they won't do it, and it's because of efficiency. Um, absolutely. And and the difference in what they're going to make. See, if the bank put their money in it, how much would they have to put in to this transaction if I came in and borrowed the money? $100, right? Okay. So right down here, Kim, if you'll put in $100, and then I'm going to have to pay the bank how much back? 115 And so the result is, if I pay them back 115 sorry, where's my rate calculator? In a year, the bank only makes 15%. Okay, so that's where they figured it out. This is a matter of leverage, and really it works just like it does in physics. It's just taking a little bit and moving it a long way. They're doing it with money instead of with machinery. But the reality is the same thing happens. So the banks figured out a long time ago the idea of OPM, or other people's money. So in this scenario, they can turn what would have been 15% into 66.67. Now, does anybody remember the end of the 80s, the beginning of the 90s, and where the banks were at that point in time? Remember Keating and his and the SNL fiasco? 
<laughs> okay, so the banks were in awful shape. And it's pretty amazing because 66.67, there are not a lot of businesses that have the luxury of, of operating with a 66.67% gross par profit margin. And Nelson, you're in the forestry side of it, but did you know much about the retail end of the lumber business? I mean, they're most of the time on a commercial level. Um, in fact, when I worked um, for Temple years ago in Houston, from a gross profit standpoint, they pushed hard to have a gross 15% profit on what they were paying for lumber and what they were selling it back out. So here's a huge company and they're looking at 15% and yet <laughs> the banks couldn't make money at 66.67. <laughs> That's a pretty scary thing. Um, but Alan Greenspan was head of the Federal Reserve at the time and he had a great idea. And his idea was that he could reduce interest rates, and if he did that, he would generate consumer spending and bail the banks out. Now, what's interesting about Greenspan is prior to that, he was an Austrian. And he backed up on his morals and changed direction and started manipulating interest rates. And this is what happened. We saw CD rates go from 9% to 3% almost overnight. When he did that, the banks were bailed out in a matter of months, and he was a hero because he fixed the problem. He blamed it, or he <laughs> took credit for the fact that consumers were now spending money, and that's what solved the problem. But I would argue that it's simple financial math because they kept their spread the same. In other words, that 6%. So now, based on that, what were they lending money out at? Nine, exactly. So now consumer debt dropped to 9%. Per year, their profit went to 200%. Okay? That's what bailed the banks out. Now, how in the world could that be? We look at that, and we look over here on this side. How much did they make in this transaction? Let's say that all the, bank, all the money the bank had in the world was $9, and that's all they could do their investing with. How much money could they make here? Six dollars, exactly. With that same nine dollars, how many of these transactions could they do? And do six on each one of them, right? So now they make 18 with the same dollars that they only made six on before. And guess what three times 66.67 is? It just happens to be 200%, okay? So, so that's what did it. What's amazing to me is <laughs> I mean, this was phenomenal. They couldn't make money at 66.67. They moved it to 200. And now we've got to have TARP money to bail them out. <laughs> you could give money away to Mexico you knew you were never going to get back and make money hand over fist with that kind of return. How is that possible? And the only thing that I can think of is maybe there's a lot of behind-the-scenes theft that went on that we have no idea about. I mean, it, it, it almost has to be. I can remember going to a seminar one time, and it was there was an attorney there. And this attorney that was speaking was suing um, brokerage houses that were mismanaging money as people were losing money. And he said, you know, this isn't a deal where somebody came in and said, oh, I didn't know there was some risk here. He said, it's not that. He said, this was blatant stuff that the, that the big brokerage houses were doing. And he said, you wouldn't believe what we uncovered. He said, some of the stuff that we uncovered from these brokerage houses, he said, we had stuff like the old Ford memo on the Pinto. He said, we found some memos uh, he said one of them in particular, he said there was one stock analyst who was, you know, talking about how great certain stocks were. They found this memo where he sent it back to the brokerage house saying, if I have to keep touting this dog of a stock, y'all are going to really have to push my income way up. So, I mean, he was, <laughs> I mean, I mean, there was blatant stuff going on and blatant theft. And what they finally determined through the whole thing was that there was so much theft going on in the brokerage houses that the SEC turned a blind eye to it because they were afraid if they exposed it that the whole thing would come apart. My guess is if you can't make money at that, the same thing must be true here.
I don't, I mean, I don't, <laughs> nothing else makes any sense. But if we take this a little bit further, when we did the TARP bailouts for the banks, did that automatically open up lending? That's what it was supposed to do, wasn't it? I mean, that was, that was the big thing. Hey, we give them a billion dollars, I mean, a trillion dollars. <laughs> if we can imagine what that is. We give them a trillion dollars, and all of a sudden now we're going to be able to get businesses moving again because there's going to be some money available, et cetera, et cetera, and it didn't happen, and why not? Well, part of it was they were paying off some of those derivatives on the bad mortgages, but that excess cash, what they were doing with that is really interesting because they were getting money from the feds at a quarter, a half, zero, and if let's just use it on the high side. Let's use a half. At the time, treasuries were at 4% per year. That's 700% profit without any risk. What did Nelson say earlier about the deposits? Is that an asset or liability for the bank? It's a liability. Why? Yeah, and you may not. <laughs> I mean, you, may, you may come get it, right? So there's a problem. Right here, what kind of problem do they have with this? What happens if somebody doesn't pay a loan back? That's a problem for the bank, isn't it? What happens right here? They avoid every bit of risk they have. They can just sit back. And the beauty of this is, from the bank standpoint, they got money. Who supplied the money in the first place? Yeah, the taxpayers, right? Who pays the interest on the treasuries? <laughs> the taxpayers. I mean, you you couldn't invent something like this if you wanted to. <laughs> really unbelievable. But in the last little while, money's freed up just a little bit. We're able to get it. And why? Where are treasuries now? They're back down in the 2% range, just over 2. At 2, it's worthwhile for them to go back out in the marketplace. And you wonder, well, why? If they've only got a 300% return, I mean, if they've got as much as a 300 here and only 200 up here, why would they go back to the marketplace? And the reason is because of the fractional reserve banking, they can only do this one time with their cash. So 300, while it's a substantial profit, is not nearly as much as 200 is five times. Okay? So it's part of the game that they're playing. And unfortunately, because we don't understand it, we are susceptible to it. My statement earlier that banks don't understand this, <laughs> bankers don't, is I explained this to the president of a bank one time. Because he had no idea this was what was going on. When he was finished, when we went through this, he said, would you do me a favor? I said, sure, anything we can help. And he said, would you not tell the board I didn't know this? <laughs> Ricky Lee's grandfather was there, Norman, and Norman said, it doesn't matter. The board doesn't know it either. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but I'll guarantee you Alan Greenspan knows it. They know it at the top, and all this is filtered down. And so if we can start to think about that on little things, it can make a difference. And you look at this and say, well, so what does that mean? Banks are bad people? Yeah, okay. But that's not all of it. The point is, why not take on the role of the banker and move this to our side of the ledger? I mean, we can do this in just small pieces and make a big difference. What if, as an example, what if we could help out a child or grandchild that was just getting out of school? Maybe this, you know, they had to take on some credit card debt to get them through school. If they want to start a professional practice of any kind, the banks are not going to be very friendly to them at all at this point. But what if I had access to money, say, at 5%? If I loaned them money at 10% and bought up all their 18, 20, somebody was saying the other day they've seen a credit card as high as 40, 43%. You miss a couple of payments in the wrong spot, and that thing just starts ratcheting, and all of a sudden they were at a 43%. Where are the usury laws? That's what I can't figure out. But So if you could, if you could buy that debt back and charge that child or grandchild 10%, would that be a huge benefit to that child or grandchild? If I do that and I have access to money at 5%, that's a 100% rate of return for me. 
Who misses out in that deal? The banks, the credit card companies, right? Do we care? <laughs> okay, so if we can kind of start thinking in those kind of terms, we can see where there could be some huge advantage on understanding how the banking system works and then using that for ourselves. Agreed?